Hi, it's Professor Peter Ebling, and we're discussing osteoporosis on the Physical Performance Show today with Brad Beard. Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to episode 312 of The Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Polar's world-leading GPS, multi-sport and running watches and their heart rate monitors. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of our different episodes, interest editions, learnings catch episodes, featured performers, and expert editions. And hot off the back of last week's episode, episode 311, featuring the Bartold clinical team of Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold, who shared around their top five running shoe innovations of the last 20 years, we are keeping the learnings coming your way this week. Today, you'll learn and enjoy sharings from Professor Peter Eblin exploring osteoporosis management across the lifespan. And if you think that this episode may not have anything to offer you, if you are not suffering from osteoporosis, think again, because we know that amongst the endurance sporting population, bone density issues can be a great concern. This can be the case in beginner athletes, recreationally competitive endurance athletes, and the elites as well. And what better guest to share around this important topic than today's expert, and that is Professor Peter Eblin. Now, Professor Eblin is, in fact, my very own endocrinologist. I've shared openly in the past that I've been on a journey to improve my bone density after a diagnosis of low density at 36 years of age, and Professor Eblin has been instrumental in guiding me towards an improvement. But by way of professional bio, there are few people on the planet who understand bone better than Professor Eblin. Professor Eblin was the Associate Editor of Journal of Bone and Mineral Research from 2008 to 2012. He currently serves on the Editorial Board of Osteoporosis International and was Editor of Clinical Endocrinology, Editor-in-Chief of Bone Reports and JBMR+. He is the Chair of the Board of Healthy Bones Australia, formerly Osteoporosis Australia, Board Member, International Osteoporosis Foundation, President of the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, the first to be elected outside of North America, the past president of Endocrine Society of Australia, the past president of the Australian and New Zealand Bone and Mineral Society. Furthermore, Peter served on the NHMRC Academy between 2009 and 2014 and the Research Committee between 2015 and 2018. Academically, Professor Eblin has 28,500 plus citations and over 450 peer-reviewed publications, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. There's been 153 publications over the last five years. Now, anyone that knows academia knows that that is prolific. In 2015, Professor Ebling was made an officer in the Order of Australia for his distinguished service to medicine in the field of bone health. Peter is clinically available as an endocrinologist through the Gene Hales for Women's Health Clinic in East Melbourne and also holds the role as head of the Department of Medicine for Monash University at Monash Health. So get your pen and paper ready for an understanding on how to optimise your bone density and in particular treat osteoporosis across the lifespan for both those who are plus 50 years of age and those who are sub 50 years of age, a very important group to ensure that their management is right. Here is Professor Peter Ebelin on this expert edition sharing around osteoporosis management across the lifespan. Professor Ebelin, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. It's really nice to be here, Brad. Thanks for inviting me. You have been on the wish list for quite some time since 
Professor Belinda Beck here on the Gold Coast, Australia, uh, introduced me to you uh, or informed me of your uh, expertise in the area of, uh, of bone and in particular osteoporosis to capture you with a man who is so full with uh, day-to-day activities is quite quite the, uh, the thrill and honour. Your academic and clinical work is absolutely extensive and extraordinary. What took you into the area of interested in, in, in bone health and particularly osteoporosis, Professor Eberlein? Yeah, well, that's a great question. It's one I tell my medical students about because when you're a medical student, you really don't know uh, what you want to do in terms of a career. And um, I told them it's really just making the most of the opportunities that present themselves. So when I was uh, doing my medical training, um, I was lucky enough to be at um, a hospital which had a very strong endocrinology unit. So a lot of the doctors working in that unit have subsequently, like me, become uh, professors of medicine and heads of academic departments of medicine. So um, I was lucky enough to um, see how good endocrinology was from these strong leaders. And um, I decided to do endocrinology because you could, it's difficult to make the diagnoses sometimes, but if you do, they're fairly transformative in terms of improving a patient's life. And a lot of the conditions are treatable. So, um, and I also like the long-term uh, management of, of patients with conditions. So you get to know them over the long term. So I guess that's the reason I chose endocrinology. And then I decided to do research and I was lucky enough to be on a team that discovered a new hormone, parathyroid hormone related protein. So that was my doctorate. And then um, I went across to America to work there for three years at the Mayo Clinic where I started doing clinical research in osteoporosis. And again, I had a really great uh, mentor there in uh, Larry Ricks. And um, I spent three years there, published a lot of papers, and then came back to Melbourne and have really continued in that vein since then with a couple of other interludes overseas uh, in Oxford and New York. So here I am today. And recently, uh, Professor Eblin, you were appointed the first non-American, I believe. Uh, yeah, so I've become the first non-North American president of the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research. So that's a huge honour and it, it's been a busy role um, since I took it on about five weeks ago. So fit in for all the contributions you've made as per your bio, over 450 peer-reviewed publications, just uh, prolific and extraordinary. Osteoporosis, if we focus there, Professor Eblin, how would you define it? Why is awareness of it so important in, in society at large, but also in, in amongst athletes? I think osteoporosis is a bit of a confusing word because it's a bit like another word, osteoarthritis. And uh, I know patients get the two confused. So really, it, it only means porous bones. That's uh, what it means, whereas osteoarthritis Uh, refers to joint disease you get with ageing. So I think it's not a great word and it's a hard one to explain to the lay community. And that's why we've renamed Osteoporosis Australia, Healthy Bones Australia, to get the idea away from a disease state but maintenance of good bone health throughout life. But um, osteoporosis occurs when you uh, break your bone after trauma that, that a normal person wouldn't break their bone. So it's a product of having reduced bone density and a reduction in bone strength that leads to that broken bone. So the thing is, you don't know you've got it and until you have a broken bone or if you get a diagnostic test. And the diagnostic test we use is bone density using a technique we call dual energy X-ray absorptiometry or DEXA. The rename of Osteoporosis Australia to Healthy Bones Australia is, uh, I think, a very smart smart move and you share that phrase there it's about maintenance of good bone health across the lifespan and we've featured this on prior episodes but i don't think it can be overstated enough i guess the key is people can do things to optimize their bone health across the lifespan correct they definitely can and really it starts in childhood and probably exercise is most important just before you go through puberty and around the time of puberty because the bones are still uh, growing then and uh, it's what we call modelling and uh, that's where the influence of uh, exercise is tremendous and it's the weight-bearing type of exercise that's important then. So playing, uh, you know, active sports like tennis or uh, football, basketball, all of those things would really help 
children optimize what we call their peak bone mass. So if we increase their peak bone mass by um, 10 or 15%, which is achievable with exercise then, that can reduce their likelihood of getting osteoporosis when they get older uh, in their 50s or 60s or 70s. And the incidence or prevalence of osteoporosis amongst the, the population is, is what, Professor Ebling? So we think uh, just over 1.3 million Australians have osteoporosis or that would be defined as having a T-score, which is a measure of bone density that's uh, comparing your bone density with uh, a young adult at the age of 30. So if that T-score is minus 2.5 or less, we call that osteoporosis if you use the bone density test to diagnose it. So we think 1.3 million Australians have osteoporosis, but another 5 million or so have low bone density or poor bone health. So um, what we want to do is to try and uh, capture those Australians and to reinforce what they can do to make their bones healthier. So 5 million Australians with poor bone health, is that defined as the osteopenia, Professor Eblin? Yes, yeah. So all osteopenia means is low bone density or not enough bone, and um, that's defined as, again, looking at those T-scores, it's a T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5. Now, a T-score is what we call in mathematical terms a standard deviation. So um, that means uh, statistically your bone density is between 1 and 2.5 standard deviations below the young adult mean. And demographically, how's this spread? So the if we focus on the 5 million Australians with poor bone health or osteopenia, uh, how's it spread? Uh, bias towards certain age groups or age brackets? Yeah, normally osteoporosis affects um, postmenopausal women, so women above the age of 50, and older men, uh, typically above the age of 60. So these groups are more at risk of getting uh, low bone density. And if we look at the broken bones that occur uh, due to um, osteoporosis, two-thirds of them are in women and one-third in men. So a lot of people don't realise that men can get low bone density and osteoporosis as well. But uh, it, it's definitely a possibility, particularly uh, men uh, used to smoke uh, quite a bit and uh, drink heavily. And both of those lifestyle factors are important uh, and can cause low bone density, but they're also genetic factors. So if you've got a family history of broken bones, that can predispose you to having um, osteoporosis whether or not you're male or female. So the role of genetics, we can't escape it. I have read that circa 70% of bone health could be genetic. Uh, What would be your guesstimate there, Professor Eblin? Yeah, it depends on which group we're looking at, but certainly uh, in uh, men and younger people, um, genetic uh, factors may be relatively more important. Um, And I think... um, it's, it's this combination of genetic predisposition and uh, lifestyle factors that are really important. Unfortunately, you can't choose your parents. That hasn't been uh, identified on how to do that yet. So um, what we're left with doing is uh, having a healthy lifestyle approach and uh, that can uh, mitigate some of your genetic risk by uh, doing that. And what I mean there is by having an adequate calcium intake so having at least three serves of calcium-containing foods a day, making sure your vitamin D uh, is normal and uh, the normal level is about 50 uh, nanomoles per litre on a blood test, so we'd like it to be above that, uh, and also uh, having regular weight-bearing exercise and uh, reducing uh, alcohol intake to the recommended levels and stopping smoking. So by doing these things, you can sort of improve or maintain your bone mass over life. Professor Eblin, you shared that people are often surprised that males develop poor bone health or osteoporosis. There is certainly that that belief, I think, that pervades a lot of society's views that this is just a condition of the mature in age and also females. Sub 50-year-olds or sub pre-menopause or menopause, uh, I work in a very biased the bias sample of uh, athletes who are runners often and endurance athletes. And if you go back to the definition that you shared that 
uh, people are often only aware that they have poor bone health when something goes wrong, whether that's a fracture or perhaps a series of bone stress injuries, stress reactions, stress fractures, et cetera. Uh, any insights you've gleaned from your clinical practice over the years with sub 50 year olds who detect that they have osteoporosis or osteopenia? Yeah, so I think this is a really important group and we've just written a couple of publications uh, reviewing this. Um, one uh, is called Secondary Osteoporosis in, and just been published online in Endocrine Reviews. Uh, and then the other one is about um, osteoporosis in young adults and the dilemmas in uh, diagnosis and treatment. And I think that's um, hopefully going to come out in JBMR Plus uh, very soon. So um, this is a really important group. And I think more often than not, um, we don't use the T-score to diagnose low bone mass under the age of 50. What we tend to use is um, a Z-score. Now, the Z-score is comparing your bone density with your uh, age and sex-matched peers who are normal. So we tend to say that if the Z score is uh, less than minus two, so that's two standard deviations lower than your age and sex match peers, that you have low bone density. Now, uh, we also say you, you would have osteoporosis if you have a chronic condition uh, associated uh, that might cause low bone density or if you've had um, a broken bone on minor trauma. So um, that could include a stress fracture. Now, um, obviously, I've seen a lot of um, athletes and um, some of them have low bone density and they get an increased likelihood of having stress fractures or stress reactions like you've mentioned. And uh, certainly I've seen a lot of professional uh, cyclists on the European tour and also uh, footballers with these uh, stress fractures. So it comes down to a couple of things. Um, one, uh, you can't exercise too much because um, your, your pituitary and hypothalamus are very sensitive to over-exercise. And irrespective of whether you're a woman or a man, uh, the uh, intensity of the exercise might increase uh, sort of your endorphin and cortisol levels, and that can shut off the hypothalamus and pituitary. Uh, to reduce the production of sex hormones. So that would be estrogen in a woman or testosterone in a man. So we see this and, and in a woman, they would have a lack of periods or amenorrhea. Um, and we call that term athletic amenorrhea uh, for that reason. And in men, there would be uh, a low testosterone level, which would be manifest as uh, low sex drive and um, maybe a reduction in body hair. So um, these things can occur, occur with too much exercise. So the amount of training you do is really uh, a balancing act. And, and the other thing, apart from that hormonal aspect, is that, um, you know, bone is like a mechanic. It's a structure that's made up of spongy bone on the middle and compact bone on the outside. And uh, it's, you know, subject to the force of recurrent loading. So if you're loading the bone too much with the exercise, um, it'll just get a, a stress fracture related to the, um, the stress on the bone uh, that's um, uh, occurring. So I think that's really important uh, to recognise that you can't, and that's why sometimes you have to moderate the amount of training you're doing. Now, these things are exacerbated if you have a low body mass index. So if your body mass index um, is below 19, which is the you know, recommended level, uh, that can make all of these things worse as well. So maybe that's why we're seeing um, high performance athletes get these stress injuries and it's just addressing those things. One of the ways to try and prevent it is boosting your calcium intake. That seems to be a good approach for uh, reducing uh, the propensity to getting these stress reactions. And I feel, thank you for sharing there, Professor Eblin. So it's multifactorial in the sub 50 year old, need to consider hormonal aspects, working with an endocrinologist like yourself uh, who understands bone and, uh, and, uh, and exercise. 
Um, and then also looking at training patterns and loads, considering BMI, which is a sub, subset, I guess, of fueling, uh, fueling that amount of activity. And it's certainly well pervasive in endurance sports, low energy availability or relative energy deficiency in sport, which uh, then can obviously heighten the risk of these bone injuries. Uh, Professor Eblin, I'm, and I've been through this personally, I've shared this on, the, on, on this program in the past, my own diagnosis with low bone density, which came quite as a shock to me as a 36-year-old that's never smoked a cigarette in his life or uh, drinks, drinks any alcohol. Uh, and I see that quite routinely with patients often in the endurance sports world. They have a sports-related injury and then through the assessment of that, they pick up low bone density. And it, I feel like there's almost a grieving period where they come to grips with that, where they feel like they were bulletproof, fit young adults, and then all of a sudden they're being told that they've got a condition that most people associate with with elderly elderly age or, or you know the maturing age. Uh, any insights you'd share around that, or comfort or reassurances? You've certainly, and you're my endocrinologist, and you have brought me great reassurance, Professor Eblin. Uh, but what would you say to that group of people that do realise they've got low bone density and they're only young in years? Yeah, well, the good thing about it is you're never too old to do something about low bone density, and it can be reversed by doing some of the things we've talked about, like. Um, making sure you have a good calorie intake, but also a good protein intake. We sort of neglect protein, but um, the, uh, the quality of the protein is also important. There have been some recent studies showing that veganism has been associated with an increased risk of osteoporosis, and it's thought um, perhaps that might be due to low-quality protein because you have to understand that the bone is also composed of protein as well as calcium and phosphorus. So uh, protein intake is, is important as well and, uh, and avoiding the low body mass index and making sure your uh, sex hormone levels are normal and avoiding those lifestyle factors. So if you do all of those things and maybe moderate your training schedule and reduce the intensity of training, uh, the, the bone density will bounce back. And, and, you know, that's what I've seen um, in particular with these young um, uh, professional cyclists who've had to actually retire from the European circuit. That they're, once they do that and adopt a, a good lifestyle, um, their bone density really goes up quite a lot. Thank you for sharing there, Professor Eblin. It's always going to be individual, of course. There's responders and non-responders on a continuum, but how much bounce back is possible? So I think you can see improvements of 5 or 10% um, using those approaches. And, and certainly in young people, we try to avoid any um, pharmacological treatment uh, as much as we can. But there are some cases where they have a lot of fractures that we might give them a short course of treatment uh, and, to, and that will also help the bone density go up. And that might include what sort of pharma, pharmacological agents, Professor Ebling? Yeah, so um, when we're thinking about stress injuries in athletes, there are sort of limited data and um, there have been studies showing that the oral um, bisphosphonates, which are anti-resorptive agents, they're taken as a weekly tablet. They can improve dent uh, bone density in this situation, but we don't have any data showing that they reduce further stress fractures. And I know that uh, in professional sports, there's another uh, medication that's been uh, used to treat osteoporosis and treat severe osteoporosis. And it's also been shown in a couple of randomised control trials to um, Im improve the healing of wrist fractures and also pelvic fractures in older women. So uh, that, that is a daily injection which actually builds new bone uh, called teriparatide. And I know that that is used uh, by um, some professional athletes to uh, sort of increase the rate of healing of um, these stress fractures. But we don't know for sure that it does uh, it's just based on these other studies with uh, complete fractures. Uh, but we, don't, we, we haven't got any trials showing that it actually improves the healing of stress fractures, unfortunately. And is there any potential downside or long-term impact of these pharmacological agents for patients or people in the, in the younger demographics? No, I, th I think not. I think, you know, the, they wouldn't be used for long periods of time. With the oral bisphosphonates, the only side effects uh, in the short term really are indigestion and a loose bowel habit. 
maybe the day after you take them. In prolonged treatment, there are rarer side effects such as osteonecrosis of the jaw or, or another type of fracture we call atypical femur fractures, but these are usually associated with long-term use, you know, for up to 10 years or so and aren't seen uh, in shorter periods of time and are very uncommon. Um, with the teriperitide, there was a concern that it uh, shouldn't be used in young people and it's contraindicated in adolescents. But in young adults, it's been used to treat osteoporosis in, in trials and it's been useful in improving bone density. Uh, and it, it's, it seems to be very safe. There was a concern that it caused osteogenic sarcoma in rats. So if you're a rat, it's not a good drug to take. <laughs> but uh, there's been a long registry study going for 15 years and of, of uh, over uh, one or two million people that took the drug over that time, there were only two cases of bone cancer, which would be expected. Uh, and for that reason, the United States, uh, this drug used to be limited to two years of treatment over a lifetime, but uh, people can now take it for as long as uh, they need to. And so teriparatide for Teo, how may that be administered? And obviously this is not medical advice, just uh, general information. It's not specific to some circumstance, but what, mm. would, what would administration potentially look like? Yeah, so with teriparatide, uh, when we use it for treating severe osteoporosis, it's given as a daily injection from a pen, so patients have to learn how to give the injection themselves. Uh, it can be associated with um, some side effects such as headache, giddiness or dizziness and nausea, uh, and some people, for that reason, have to take it um, in the evenings before they go to bed to minimise those side effects. But most people uh, learn how to use the, uh, the pen device pretty readily. But having said that, there's probably um, quite a, a large proportion that don't want to have the medication because of the uh, nature of the administration as an injection. And is that ongoing indefinitely or is there uh, periods well, on in, and off? In Australia, we were talking about Australia, it's limited to two years uh, per lifetime that you can take uh, teriparatide. Whether or not that'll change in Australia like it has in the United States, uh, I'm not sure. So two years of, of dosage per lifetime, so that can be broken up in, uh, yeah. in intervals. Yeah, so in the, in the treating severe osteoporosis, we usually use it continuously for two years because then what we do is consolidate the benefits. We get all this new bone that's formed, but it, some of it, it doesn't have a lot of calcium. So then if you add... Um, and because it's new bone, if you add an anti-resorptive agent like the drugs we were talking about, a bisphosphonate or another drug called denosumab, then the bone density will go up further. So the, the appropriate sequence, uh, the sort of Rolls-Royce treatment for osteoporosis would be to give one of these drugs that increases bone formation, we've got two at the moment, and then giving an anti-resorptive drug after that. But at the moment, for osteoporosis, the reimbursement is such that we have to use these bone building drugs as second line treatment when the uh, less expensive anti resorptive drugs uh, stop working and patients have more broken bones. And of course, uh, it's going to be individualized always, and hence mm -hmm. why anyone working through low bone density does need a a sound endocrinologist, someone like Professor Eblin in their corner. And I was warned, uh, Professor Eblin, that not all endocrinologists would necessarily understand the sub 50 year old uh, or the exercising one. And I sought some local assistance early through ease. And and the advice was very different to uh, the advice that say, you've shared with me. And so I think like most medical conditions, you do need to choose your practitioners wisely. Yeah, I think um, you have the opportunity of not going back to see a specialist if you sort of for some reason aren't satisfied with them and, and to choose another one or ask your GP to select another one to refer you to. So that's that's quite fine, really, yeah. And certainly not throwing any colleagues under the bus, of course, uh, but it's just important to make sure you're comfortable, I guess, with the specialists you are working with. Bone turnover markers, Professor Eblin, uh, what what's available there? Uh, the diagnosis can be made on via DEXA, like you shared earlier. Uh, but bone turnover markers and the role of blood work. Can you share around that? Yeah, so um, that's a good question, Brad. And um, 
bone turnover markers. Um, so how we get osteoporosis is there are, there are a number of bone cells uh, there and there's one that resorbs bone or breaks down bone and that's called an osteoclast. And the other type of important bone cell is the one that builds new bone and that's called an osteoblast. So uh, generally when osteoporosis occurs, there's an imbalance between the activity of the bone breaking down cell and the bone forming cell. So um, what we see most commonly is the bone breaking down cell is working overtime and uh, you're losing bone. So if that's the case, we can then measure some of the products from the bone uh, that's being broken down in the blood. And what we measure is uh, a thing called the CTX or c telopeptide, which is a part of the collagen uh, molecule that's bro uh, broken down or chewed up by the osteoclast and then appears in the blood. So we can measure that in a morning specimen, but it's really important that you don't eat before you have the blood test because if you eat, the, the marker can go down. And it's important to have it in the morning because these markers change during the day. Um, uh, so um, that's the best time to have it. And the other type of marker is what we call a bone formation marker. Um, and that is, again, it's um, cleaved off when the collagen is actually made and comes out in the blood, and we can measure that as well. And that's called a P1NP level. Um, so we can measure that in the morning as well to see um, how much bone formation there is. So uh, how we generally use these bone turnover markers is first initially to see if there's any imbalance. So you might have a high CTX and a low P1NP, and that's sort of a bad scenario. And then we'd recommend uh, if your bone density was low that you have an anti-resorptive drug. Then if we're putting you on one of these medications, we can measure the, the, the response of these bone turnover markers after a few months. Uh, and if you're taking a tablet, we want to make sure it's being absorbed and that you're taking it properly. So I usually get people back a few months after being on one of those oral bisphosphonate drugs we talked about uh, to make sure it's working. So that's one way to use it. And then similarly, if we're using one of the bone building drugs, then I would measure the bone formation marker, the P1NP level, a few months after people start on a bone building drug to make sure that that's gone up. And that usually goes up, you know, either doubles or goes up three times uh, when people are on these bone building drugs. Whereas the other uh, bone resorption market, we put people on the other types of drugs, that goes down by about um, 70% or so. Fascinating things. Uh, the 24 hour urine test, uh, Professor Eblin, I've been through that one myself. Uh, what does that involve and what's the yeah. what can be gleaned from that? Yeah, so again, um, one of the conditions that can cause osteoporosis in young people and in older people uh, is that there's a leak of calcium from the kidney. So the way we can find out if that's occurring is to collect uh, every drop of urine over 24 hours and uh, measure how much calcium your body's uh, churning out over 24 hours. Now, the good thing about that is we can uh, treat that leakage by giving you a fluid tablet just by a simple um, what we call thiazide diuretic, um, going on half a tablet or one tablet of that every day. That will stop the calcium leak in the urine and uh, the, the bone density will probably go up a little bit as well. So once again, follow the, uh, the guidance of your specialist or endocrinologist uh, and go through the, the required process. Something that I learned going through the process, Professor Eblin, was I guess the sensitivity of bone. Uh, at one stage, my bone uh, resorption markers from memory were a little low and, and I'd just come off the back of, uh, were a little high, I should say, off a recent bone stress injury. And you commented that, well, that's likely reflective of that. So that, uh, this is very sensitive machinery. It is because when we break a bone, there's, uh, they're really in um, hyperdrive, if you like, all these bone cells, both the bone resorbing cells and the bone forming cells. So um, what they're doing is getting rid of the broken bone and building new bone. And um, that means that they're, they're usually very high after one of these stress fractures or fractures uh, that we find that 
the some of the bone formation markers can remain elevated for about a year after a broken bone. So we have to be aware of that. You're listening to Professor Peter Eblin sharing around the all-important topic of osteoporosis management across the lifespan. Support for today's show comes from the team at Polar. Coming from the heart of the Nordics and with over 40 years of proven performance, Polar believe it all starts with heart. Their products simply give you the most accurate way to plan, train and recover. Polar's Precision Prime heart rate technology is the most accurate way to plan and track your activity and recovery 24-7, 365. Born in the Nordics to beautiful designs, their watches are built to withstand the toughest conditions and make sure you've got a stunning watch for any occasion. Their training load insights allow you to explore the limits of your body so you can find out if you are training just right to improve your performance and reduce injury. And their nightly recharge can allow you to truly understand and predict your recovery so you can not only own the night, but win the day. So if you feel like it's time to beat your best, jump across to Shop Polar at polar.com and check out their all-new range. Support for today's show also comes from the team at Precision Fuel and Hydration. The team have a range of tools and products to help you personalise your fueling and hydration strategy so that you can perform at your best. Long-term listeners of the show will have known Precision Fuel and Hydration as just Precision Hydration, but they've changed their name to reflect the fact that they've been helping athletes nail both aspects of their performance for a very long time now. Everyone sweats differently and the amount of fuel we require varies depending on factors like the duration and intensity of activity, so a one-size-fits-all approach to fueling and hydration just doesn't cut it. Head to precisionfuelandhydration.com, use the free online sweat test, take the quick carb calculator and then book a free one-to-one video consult with the team to refine your hydration and fueling strategy. As a listener of the show, you can get 15% off your first order of fueling and hydration products by using the code TP. PPS22 at the checkout at precisionfuelandhydration.com. For now, let's jump back with this week's learnings brought to you by Professor Peter Eblin, osteoporosis management across the lifespan. Professor Eblin, there's a term that uh, I know yourself and your colleagues, research colleagues, uh, are researching. I think there's a trial going at the moment called osteosarcopenia and it's the first time i've seen that word sarcopenia uh is quite widely recognized in in the healthcare circles but can you elaborate on this term osteosarcopenia and why it matters yeah so i think um what uh, and really uh, gustavo Duquet, who's at the university of melbourne here in, in melbourne has been the one looking at this and this is just uh, to determine whether people who have got the combination of uh, low bone density or osteoporosis together with um, low muscle mass sarcopenia, as a group, they tend to have a greater risk of getting broken bones um, than people without uh, the combination of sarcopenia. So again, it's really, it gets back to some of the nutritional things we were talking about to try and prevent people getting uh, muscle wasting as they age. So it's, uh, again, I think that emphasises the need for adequate nutrition and protein and calcium, but also regular weight-bearing exercise uh, as we age. And I think, um, you know, as people get older, they don't exercise as much. So I think that's a real difficulty of how we get people in their 60s and 70s uh, continuing to exercise uh, in a regular way, because once you stop, you lose it. So um, if you don't use it, you lose it. Or, um, yeah, so you've got to keep doing it. And, and how do we engage people with an exercise that they'll enjoy doing and keep doing two or three times a week in the long term? So it's a big dilemma. And the type of exercise we know matters and research colleague or peer, Professor Belinda Beck, her work with, say, the O'Neiro Bone Program, where it's resistance training, which is often not something that those in later years would gravitate towards, but there's been some great results with with resistance training on the skeleton. Yeah, so Belinda did her study, uh, and we did a study in Melbourne as well, uh, led by Rob Daly uh, in community gyms in um, in Western Melbourne, where I was, 
and that was called the Osteosize Program. Um, and it's this high intensity progressive resistance training that's really important. And uh, if you do that, um, your muscles will get stronger, but you also your bones will get stronger and uh, the bone density will go up um, by a few percent depending on where you're measuring it. So um, I think uh, people definitely feel better when they're doing these exercises as well. Uh, and hopefully they become more active generally as, as well as having the, the focused exercise. So yeah, it's a really important thing. Uh, and uh, I think that works because um, you're being supervised and uh, you like to turn up uh, to meet the other people. And that's what, certainly what we found with our osteosize program. That was a group exercise program, so small groups of six people and they feel committed to come and uh, exercise together. They build up social um, communications with the others in their group and feel obliged to go. So these are some strategies we can use to try and encourage people to attend exercise regularly. We can make them pay for it. And that's another way, I guess. Yeah, whatever it takes to uh, engender lifelong participation with activities that will help for not only just the skeleton, but also resistance training with uh, sarcopenia or reduction in muscle mass. So, so key. So the groups obviously involved in this are physiotherapists and exercise physiologists. And if a patient has osteoporosis, their GP can develop a chronic care plan and uh, five visits a year to a physiotherapist or exercise physiologist will be covered by Medicare under that chronic care plan. So that's the other thing we encourage um, the GPs to do. On that, the cost of osteoporosis to Australia nationally, what is the impact of osteoporosis-related injuries or conditions? Yeah, so currently the cost, Brad, is about $3.2 billion a year, and uh, most of that cost is related to treating the fractures. Uh, probably um, just over $2 million is related to treating the fractures and then uh, there are other costs as well. Um, so that's why we need to do something about it, particularly as the population is ageing. Uh, we don't want these costs to keep going up. Um, and, uh, you know, in the next 10 years, that would cost us, um, you know, th between 35 and 40 billion unless we do something about it. Goodness, we could uh, pay off the, uh, the COVID-related debts with uh, that saving, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it always goes somewhere else. <laughs> Oh, uh, gosh. That's hard. Professor Eblin, uh, athletes coming out of cam walkers or boots that have been deloaded to heal a bone injury, often a little bit surprised with sometimes the radiological reports around transient bone loss through deloading. Any advice or encouragement, reassurance you'd share to that group? Yeah, certainly that occurs quite quickly, you know, and um, I guess the extreme form is after paraplegia where uh, they lose bone very dramatically from the lower limbs and spine. And, uh, you know, we can preempt that by giving them some intravenous bisphosphonates. But, um, yeah, I think uh, it, it will uh, go quite quickly in a cam walker over, you know, six weeks or so. And then the, the answer is to gradually reintroduce weight-bearing exercise and hopefully you'll regain a lot of the bone that's been lost. It's a great uh, example of the mechanosensitivity of the skeleton. It, is. it goes, but it does come back. It does. And uh, there are another type of bone cell I haven't talked about is the osteocyte, and that controls uh, the response of the skeleton to exercise. It sits in a little lake uh, in the bone, and uh, that's why the weight-bearing exercise is important because it'll start bouncing around in that lake and it'll send off a signal uh, to inhibit an inhibitor of bone formation and uh, that results in an increase in bone density. So that's how the mechanostat works in bone. The thought that bone is just a dead inert structure in our body is, uh, couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, so if I was giving this um, interview uh, 10 years ago, we'd both be sitting here with different skeletons because that's how long it takes for our whole skeleton to be replaced. Ten years. Ten years. Gosh. And uh, one year for uh, full mineralization of bone that's reforming. Is that correct? Yes. If, we if we think about um, if you went for a run today and you got a sort of a little stress fracture on uh, one of your bones in the feet, 
uh, the osteoclasts would come in and uh, sweep away that dead bone and then the bone forming cells would lay down new bone and it would all be repaired. That whole process would take about three months. So that's occurring all over the skeleton. And if you look at it, how long it would take to replace the whole skeleton, it would be about 10 years. Oh, gosh. Fascinating. Professor Eblin, a clinical finding or clinical radiological report that occasionally pops up is this transient bone marrow edema that seems to be associated with symptomatology or pain in, in that region. Anything you'd share around that? I've heard medical colleagues debate whether it's a legitimate condition or not, or whether it's just pure bone stress, transient bone marrow edema. Uh, what, what's uh, happened is that we've come up with this diagnosis and it's based on MRI findings. So once you've started doing MRIs, you've come up with this uh, sort of diagnosis. So it's an MRI diagnosis and we're not really sure of the clinical associations, but sometimes it can be associated with pain and we just also wonder if it's uh, occurring before a stress reaction occurs, you know, it might be the first thing that occurs leading to a stress reaction. So maybe it's a bit of a warning, but we're not quite sure about it. The role of orthobiologics uh, in bone healing, Professor Eblin, I guess you'd mainly see it more in the athletic populations trying to get ready for an event or a major competition, but any, anything you'd share around the effectiveness or otherwise of certain agents? Uh, which ones were you thinking about in particular? So things like exogen units, et cetera. Yeah, I don't know that there's any objective evidence that they work. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've gone through a phase of thinking that vitamin K2 might be helpful. Um, so that might be one of the things. But there was a recent study that was done in Denmark. It was just published this year. And um, that showed that um, in two groups of people, one, they both got calcium and vitamin D. And uh, one of the groups got um, vitamin K2 and the other got placebo. And there was no difference in the bone density over a couple of years. So we don't think vitamin K2 has got a major effect. Um, um, vitamin D is probably most important in those with the lowest vitamin D level. So less than, say, 30 nanomoles per litre. But we know in particularly the institutionalised uh, elderly that the combination of calcium and vitamin D <clears throat> will prevent fractures, and that's probably because a lot of them have very low vitamin D levels. So in South Australia, they give calcium and vitamin D to everybody in a hostel or nursing home there. Um, in Queensland, probably people get outside more and there's less, uh, we know there's less vitamin D deficiency in the population, but in somewhere like Melbourne or uh, Tasmania, about 50% of the population will have a low vitamin D level in winter. Uh, in those states. So, yeah, vitamin D is probably an important thing still. And the best way to correct that is sun exposure, but then there's also times where that's just not available and therefore... Yeah. So we don't recommend um, going outside of the UV index. It's above three. And if you do, to apply sunscreen, uh, wear a hat and sunglasses and seek shade. So um, the thing is um, when you apply sunscreen, you don't apply it perfectly and you can still make a little bit of vitamin D even if you do um, have sunscreen on, and that's been shown in a study from Sydney. So um, that's probably good news, yeah. Is there a minimum amount of exposure needed to increase vitamin D levels or it's variable depending on the, the sun intensity, etc.? Yeah, so um, what you probably need is just um, a few minutes um, uh, in uh, the summer months, but in the, in the winter months, you may need, depending where you live, um, quite a long time in the sun at midday, like that would be half an hour in, or longer in, in Melbourne, depending on your skin uh, pigmentation. Professor Eblin, you've been very generous with your time and, of course, your expertise, and every guest of the show gets issued two set questions. So the first is if you could, and we'll keep this contextualize to this topic of bone health across the lifespan if you could boil everything you've learned through your professional career to date into one single piece of advice to help listeners of this show optimize their bone health what would that be professor eblin i think uh, move it or you will lose it <laughs> move it or you will lose it that's uh <laughs> that's, that's uh that's brilliant and fitting 
And the second set question, Professor Eblin, is this, and every guest issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So what is Professor Eblin's physical challenge going to be? So it would be something to improve your bone health. So I think you should do uh, high-intensity progressive uh, uh, resistance training for at least three times a week, so for 20 or 30 minutes. High-intensity progressive resistance training three times a week for yeah. circa 20 to 30 minutes. Yep. Yeah. Very, very uh, important. Professor Eveline, you are prolific academically. You're available clinically as well. Uh, but are there any projects you'd like to flag at the moment that you might be recruiting for subject-wise with your studies, et cetera? I, I, I did the maths on this last night, Professor Eblin, 450 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, I think it was 153 across five years. I worked that out to be circa 16 per month. That's, ex- <laughs> that's extraordinary. Well, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. We've got lots of PhD students <laughs> and postdoctoral fellows and they're all working very hard. It's really a team. It's just not me, obviously. Um, yeah. I don't get a lot of sleep, though, I'd have to say. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, what we're interested in at the moment is doing one of the first studies in the Indigenous bone health and um, We've been very careful in setting up um, consultative processes with um, Indigenous communities um, in Perth and in Melbourne, and we're trying to recruit um, people into that just to find out why Indigenous Australians have hip, broken hips about 20 years younger than um, other Australians. So we're trying to f- figure out why that's the case. Um, and then uh, we're also interested in doing research on an unusual type of fracture that's associated with long-term bisphosphonate use, and that's in the femur. So um, if anybody has had one of these what we call atypical femur fractures, we're trying to work out if there is a genetic cause or whether there's a problem with the, the geometry of the femur that might predispose to people getting this. So... Um, yeah, we're doing that in collaboration with um, universities at Oxford and in Erasmus University in the Netherlands and uh, also some universities in Singapore and, and Thailand. So it's because it's a rare disease, we've got an international approach to that problem. So, yeah, there's some of the things we're working on at the moment. And you're available clinically uh, via Jean Hales for Women's Health Clinic East Melbourne. Yeah, I'm very limited, only half a day a week. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I was informed that it might be difficult to, to get in to see you, but uh, I certainly have been appreciative of uh, your guidance for my own personal health and many of my patients uh, who have been referred your way. Professor Eblin, uh, I do hope you uh, get some sleep tonight. And uh, I, I should ask, though, your view on the role of sleep and skeletal health. I think sleep is really important for all aspects of health and probably for your skeleton as well. We're not quite clear, um, but I think um, it's really important for your cardiovascular health in particular. So um, just seven or eight hours is always a a good target to aim for. Professor Eblin, thank you for your contribution to the show. It's a pleasure, Brad. Thanks for asking me. So there you have it, another episode of The Physical Performance Show, and I trust and I know you enjoyed today's sharings from Professor Peter Eblin. It's such an important topic. If you enjoyed today's learnings, please take a screenshot of the episode and post it to your socials at Physical Performance Show on Instagram. Now, you'll find video recordings of these episodes and snippets over on our YouTube channel to search The Physical Performance Show. A massive thanks to our show patrons who make the show possible and, of course, our show supporters, Polar and Precision Fuel and Hydration. If you'd like to consider becoming a patron of the show, you can do so from just $5 US per month. In return, we'll grant you access complimentary to our back catalogue of live stream events and our upcoming live stream events, including a live stream event we've recently penciled in with repeat live stream guest and well-loved guest of the show, Stephen Seiler, the forefather of polarised training. Now, this live stream will be occurring on the 2nd of April, so mark your calendars, with the topic for the live stream being durability and high-intensity repeatability in endurance training. It's a mouthful, but you're not going to want to miss it. Tickets are available over on our new website, physicalperformanceshow.com. That's physicalperformanceshow.com. Secure your place from just $49.00 per person, which of course includes a video recording of the live stream following the live stream live date. 
A huge thanks to the team who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin, show administration, Matthew Olding, show graphic design. Now, looking ahead on the Physica Performance Show, we have a great schedule coming your way. Dr. Dan Plews drops by once more to discuss heart rate variability and how it can apply to improving your training and performance. Emma Jeffcoat stops by the Physica Performance Show headquarters as a featured performer. US-based physical therapist and academic Eric Hegedus bring us an expert edition around return to run programming. But next week, you'll enjoy a fun conversation with acclaimed author Jenny Valentish, who's recently published a great read in a book titled Everything Harder Than Everyone Else, Why Some of Us Push Our Bodies to Extremes. It's a great and fun look at why we do as an endurance community what we do. Here's a snippet from my conversation with Jenny Valentish. So the sort of parallels between addiction or addictive behavior and and ultra running in particular, I mean, there's the obvious things like, you know, the suite of kind of endorphins and chemicals that you're going to experience, although it's a much much longer, harder pursuit of them. But, you know, it's also a very ruminative solo kind of pursuit. It's quite meditative. It's goal driven. You know, if you think of like drug taking, for instance, there's the acquisition of the drug, you know, there's a whole mission involved. There's the suffering and self-flagellation kind of kind of aspects of it. You know, if you think of like ultra run races, they've often got names like Hurt 100, and the marketing material just looks like people are at death's door. You know, and that's somehow really attractive. And, and I think that's got great parallels to people who are you know drawn to drug use actually. So be sure to be tuning in next week. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Mm-hmm.